Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first of our seminars in the uh, World Christianity Seminar Series, which is coordinated jointly between the Cambridge Center for Christianity Worldwide and the Faculty of Divinity. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Jörg Haustein. I'm a lecturer in World Christianities here at the faculty, and uh, call is facilitated kindly by the center through Mutaraj Swami, who will also say something at the end, and I have the pleasure of chairing this meeting. And it's a great joy to welcome as our first speaker in the seminar series uh, this term, Professor Jan Stievermann from Heidelberg. Welcome, who is Professor of the History of Christianity in the US. It's a very interesting appointment. It's a joint appointment in Heidelberg between the uh, Faculty of Theology and the Center of American for American Studies. So it's kind of a, it's called a bridge professorship. So yeah, there's a lot of bridge building involved in it. Um, and um, I've known Jan for a long time from common time in Heidelberg, and we've engaged over the years on quite a number of issues related to global Christianity. He's also given me some very helpful feedback on my German East Africa work. And his work covers a broad range of different interests, but I would say it converges in three main areas. Firstly, Transcendentalism, and that was his first book on Ralph Waldo Emerson, and is a continued interest in kind of understanding the interchange between Enlightenment, Christianity, and Transcendentalism, or early esotericism, in my uh, words, I suppose. Uh, the second interest uh, is Anglo-American religious history, with a special focus on Puritanism and early evangelicalism. So Jan Stevenman has co-edited the Oxford Handbook uh, of Jonathan Edwards. He is also the director of the center, Jonathan Edwards Center in Heidelberg. Um, and he's also uh, quite involved in um, the editing of Cotton Mather's Biblia Americana, so this is the earliest British American Bible commentary. He's edited two of, what is it, 10 volumes? Mm -hmm. um, and is also the executive, or one of the executive editors of the entire project. And he's also written on Martha in a monograph that came out with Moore Seebeck in 2016. And the third um, interest, and that really ties in very well or this is what this project, this presentation today comes from, is I would say global religious history. So actually tying together the strands, not being stranded in America as it were, or British evangelical history, but actually mapping out global connections. And there's a number of different things in which this comes out in his work. He's more recently done some work on minority literature in America, especially on German language minority cultures, but also um, in just understanding the um, global, um, mapping of evangelicalism in relation with mission movements. And this is what this paper is about today, a syncretism of piety, imagining global Protestantism in early 18th century Boston, Trankaba and Halle, in which he promises to trace out for us a construct of how common of Protestant religion, a common understanding, common concept of Protestant religion evolved, not simply uh, in the heads of theologians sitting in Boston, Cambridge, or Wittenberg, but actually in relation to the mission field and people meeting one another. So very much looking forward to your paper, Jan. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Jörg, uh, for the nice uh, introduction, also for the invitation. And good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for joining. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here with you, if only virtually. I, I wish I could be in Cambridge. So, um, I will be speaking about the Protestant imaginary connecting these three places in the very early years of the 18th century. That's Boston, Massachusetts, Halle, um, and the Duchy of Magdeburg, then uh, Prussian um, ruled, and uh, the Danish colony of Trankabar. In December 1717, the Boston Congregational Minister Cotton Mather sent a letter along with a gift of gold nuggets and a stack of devotional books to Bartholomeus Ziegenbalg, co-founder of the Halle Mission in the Danish colony of Trankabar. Before it finally reached Southern India, after months of travel, the letter went through London, where another Halle pietist, Anton Wilhelm Böhme, was the court chaplain of Prince George, Queen Anne's Danish husband. Böhme served as a, as a kind of a middleman 
and was a growing Anglo-American network of revivalists and reformers, many of whom were associated with the Society for the Promotion of Christian Knowledge, SBCK. Now, Ziegenbach died in February 1719 before he could respond, but his co-worker, Johann Ernst Gründler, took up the task and wrote back to Mather by the end of the year. Composed in Latin, these letters were not of a private nature, it needs to be emphasized, but had the character of official reports and theological pronouncements. So multiple copies were made on both sides and, and filed with the respective uh, also institutions, for instance, in Halle, in the SPCK um, archives. Now, this exchange was part of a larger correspondence um, and here are the three actors I, I just uh, talked about, um, Mather, uh, Ziegenbalg, and, and Gründler. Um, it was a part of a larger correspondence and exchange of literature and donations between Mather, Böhme, other SBCK representatives like Henry Newman, but also August Hermann Franke uh, on the German pietist side several of his associates, notably Johann Heinrich Kallenberg, the founder of the Missionary Institute at Halle, as well as several Halle-trained missionaries besides um, uh, Ziegenbalg and Gründler. This network had slowly emerged around 1710 and flourished until the passing of the elder Franke and Mather, after which it declined despite the efforts of their sons and colleagues to keep it alive into the mid 1730s. So the last publications that directly emerged from this network are in the mid 1730s. From the beginning, the nature of true religion, the renewal of the Protestant churches, projects of charity and reform, as well as missions were central concerns in this network, which also produced a number of publications derived from the epistolary exchanges. And the principal archives in which um, this correspondence uh, can be found and reconstructed, the principal archives are the ones that you see on the slide here. So one's actually located in Cambridge, if you wanna go and take a look. And um, this is just an example of what these letters look like. Um, all written in Latin um, because Mather uh, didn't uh, speak or write German um, and the uh, Halle Pietists did not speak English except for, for Böhme, of course, and his successor in London. Now, several scholars have looked at the conversation between Boston, Halle and Trankebar. This is not a uh, new ground per se. Yet its full extent across different archives is only now coming into view. Uh, new pieces are uh, appearing. And most importantly, the larger significance of this correspondence still awaits fuller consideration. Among other things, the correspondence between Mather and his pietist interlocutors provides a fascinating window, window into the beginning of Protestantism as a world religion. Uh, recently, Daniel J. Raj and Edward E. Andrews uh, made the convincing argument that although as an actual missionary site, Trankabar might have accomplished relatively little, it was still outstanding for the fact that it was sustained by joint efforts of European and British actors, if only for a relatively short period of time. Its true significance, however, as Andrews has written, was how it served as a discursive knot, and I quote Andrews, that linked Indian, Danish, German, British, and American Protestants together through monetary, epistolary, and textual exchanges, end of quote, and provided them with a common point of reference in the process of defining, quote, an expensive imagined community that scholars have called the Protestant International, end of quote. Andrew's point is well taken, but backs a deeper question, I think. What does the Boston trunk of our Halle conversation tell us about the historical evolution of Protestantism as a theological construct and a category of religious identity that came to have meaning and resonance across denominational and linguistic divides? 
The Protestant Tranquebar Halle network was one important conduit, I think, through which the category of Protestantism crossed over from Britain into the world of continental pietism, resulting in new interpretations on both sides. The texts produced in this network offer fascinating insights into the new con interconfessional and translingual discourses about the Protestant religion, its essential nature and historical destiny as the protagonists understood it. They show that this discourse about Protestantism as it emerged in the early 18th century had transoceanic dimensions and was in many ways occasioned by the globalization of Christianity through colonialism and missions. Geopolitically, the discourse about Protestantism evolved in a situation of an intensifying worldwide contest between Catholic and Protestant powers, which fought each other over territories and empires, but also over whose version of Christianity would gain influence over millions of heathen souls, as uh, the missionaries saw it. Intellectually, uh, this discourse, as I will argue, was connected to and intersected with the larger discourse about religion as a universal category and um, this understanding that mankind was divided into different religions. A number of fine studies, uh, let me, oh, uh, sorry, before I go on, um, these are some of the important titles that, uh, printed titles that came out of the network. And uh, later on, I will be uh, quoting, especially the India Christiana, but also um, um, uh, some of Mather's other um, uh, publications, uh, including Malachi. I can say more about these publications in the Q&A if you uh, want to have more um, information. And yeah, I should have showed this earlier here. Um, um, are the uh, publications I was referring to earlier, in particular, the Edward Andrews, uh, the recent piece from the William and Mary Quarterly. So a number of fine studies, include a, including Peter Harrison's frequently cited book, um, you have the title here, have reconstructed the leading roles that enlightenment theologians and philosophers, especially deists, played in giving birth to the proto-modern concepts of religion and religions, uh, which then fully um, emerged in the 19th century. The few studies that exist on the emerging discourse of Protestantism have for the most part also focused on the European enlightenment and emphasized the influence of rationalistic theologies in developing um, this concept. One important um, uh, concept if, is the very brief but fine book by Thomas Kidd, The Protestant Interest. For the German speaking world in which Protestantisch or Protestantismus were hardly ever used as positive terms of self description before the 18th century, Friedrich Wilhelm Graf has foregrounded the pioneering role of rationalist theologians in adopting this designation and identity, mostly again from English sources. According to Graf, these rationalist theologians forced a close, forged a close connection between a comprehensive understanding of the Protestant religion, reasonableness, individual freedom, independent thinking, interiority, and moral virtue, a connection with, with, which would then dominate the discourse about Protestantism through the 18th century and beyond. So according to Graf and others, the adaptation of Protestantism as a transconfessional and transnational identity happened mostly at the hands of Enlightenment theologians in the second half of the 18th century. As I will argue and demonstrate, revivalist oriented clergymen and especially those um, active or in, very interested in the mission field created their own version of pan-Protestantism and they started to do so even earlier than those Enlightenment rationalists and deists that um, Harrison and Graf um, are talking about. 
By examining the Boston Halle Tronke Bar network, I want to give an example for how different pietistic groups and networks importantly contributed to these discourses and how they conceptualized and propagated versions of religion and Protestantism, which are quite distinct from those developed under the premises of Enlightenment rationalism. I'm not claiming that the Boston Halle Tranke Bar um, version is the only one and that they are the decisive network in doing this. This would be ridiculous. There are many others. The Moravians, for instance, um, almost right around the same time are another important network involved in this. But um, this is one, I think, significant example for how revivalist pietistically oriented um, uh, groups are involved in this in ways that haven't really been understood by uh, the existing historiography. The version of Protestantism negotiated through the Boston Tranke Bahala channels is remarkable for its combination of revivalistic and missionary fervor with a more conservative commitment to confessional orthodoxies and established church polities. As such, it provided an identity category that could be shared by all true believers across the churches of the Reformation, as well as more recent dissenting groups. At the same time, this version of pan-Protestantism became a utopian project to be realized in history by spreading the kingdom of Christ across the globe. All right. For reasons of time, I will here focus mostly on the letters exchanged between Mather and Gründler in 1717, 1719, which Mather then subsequently published as part of his India Christiana, um, which came out in 1721. But I will also glance at some other publications as I go along. Um, in the fuller version of this, of course, um, uh, the whole correspondence as it emerged in the 1710s uh, into the 1730s um, would have to be examined. Mather starts his letter to Ziegenberg by praising missionary work um, as the, and I quote, most noble of all that are or ever can be undertaken among the children of men. And this sentiment was shared by his pietist correspondents who considered following the great commandment to be a, the, a Christian's highest calling. Um, so they're making missionary work the core of Christian Protestant uh, identity in, in, in the early years of the 18th century here. And in so doing, they stood against the opinion of many representatives of Lutheran and Reformed Orthodoxy, who believed that this call had been essentially fulfilled at the end of the apostolic age. Both sides, uh, Mather and Gründler, um, shared a deep frustration and an anxiety over how little, virtually nothing really, uh, the churches of the Reformation had done on the missionary front. And I quote, while at the same time, as Mather bitterly notes, the Church of Rome strives with an unwearied and extravagant labor to propagate the idolatry and superstition of Antichrist and advance the empire of Satan, end of quote. Mather here would have primarily, primarily thought of the great Franciscan and Jesuit missions in New Spain and New France. This was his sort of uh, geographical horizon. In his reply, Gründler confirmed Mather's assessment with a view to India. I quote, as to the Popish mission in this our India, they are thought more numerous than ours. Indeed, started as recently as 1705, the Danish Halle mission had only a handful of people at the time. And they sensed an overwhelming opposition, both from the natives whose minds and hearts, as Grünther writes, had been so enthralled by Satan to make them disposed against the gospel truth, but also an overwhelming opposition from their Catholic competitors who were so much more successful, also because they allowed the natives to graft, as Grundler writes, paganism into their popery. So 
So if people like Gründler and Mather perceived a worldwide contest with Catholicism, this of course had also to do with the geopolitical situation after the war of the Spanish succession. Um, in his treatise, Manichim, uh, 1716, uh, penned right around the same time as the letter to India, Mather addressed the situation in dramatic words. And I quote, the prevailing of popery, he writes, has been formidable. The Protestant interest has been reduced so low that it has uh, not at this day much more than half of that extent of people and countries which it had acquired in 60 years after the appearance of the first reformers." End of quote. It bears emphasis that Mather here uses the term Protestant uh, in an inclusive sense that comprises all the different denominations of the Reformed family, including Baptists, who had been, of course, earlier heavily persecuted in his native Massachusetts, but also including Lutherans. This reflects the broadening of the English term and identity category in the late 17th century more generally but Mathers is especially inclusivist. Um, so he pushes forward with um, um, broadening a, a definition that was uh, already pretty expansive in the years after 1688. Um, and um, he was not the only dissenter um, very eager to do so. Uh, while at the same time uh, demonstrating their integration into the Protestant empire of Britain, um, also as a way to claim their full civil rights therein. As Thomas Kidd has shown, the new language of Protestantism also involved identification with an international Protestant community as a, uh, quote, Kidd, a beleaguered but faithful world community of true Christians everywhere locked in battle with popery. Among the heirs of Puritanism, so Mather, this global threat of Catholicism was interpreted in eschatological terms as the last raging of the Antichrist before his fall. By the providence of God, the evangelical churches would be preserved against all odds and eventually prevail. To Mather's mind, the death of Louis XIV, the failure of the Stuart uprisings, and the Hanoverian succession to the English throne in 1714 were providential tokens for, God, for good unto the Protestant religion. Moreover, he, like his pietist correspondents, thought that the rise of evangelical missions should be viewed as a sign for the dawning of better times for the church. It is against this background that we must understand how both letter writers express a joyful sense of mutual recognition and friendship halfway across the world, as well as across denominational boundaries. Convinced that they were working for the same good in the West and East Indies, and that's a phrase that they love to use, West and East Indies always in this kind of combination, um, suggesting the sense of comprehensiveness. Uh, Mather and Gründler then engage in reflection on how the gospel should be interpreted and taught to their respective Indians, quote unquote. That is, on Mather's sides, the Algonquin speaking native tribes of New England and the Tamil people on the Coromandel coast, in the Pietist case. Mather certainly would have regarded himself as a champion of Reformed orthodoxy in a firm belief and firmly believed that a congregational church polity was most scriptural, truer to scripture than, let's say, the Lutheran system. However, in writing to Trankabar, he expresses a more ecumenical sentiment and calls it the very firstborn of my wishes that all the servants of God who do and endure many things for the evangelizing of the world may exhibit unto the whole world the pure maxims of the everlasting gospel and would preach unto the nations only the weightier matters of the gospel." End of quote. Significantly, this essential Christianity of the everlasting gospel, as Mather calls it, is understood um, in doctrinally very minimalistic terms and primarily as a vital and practical piety. 
it is most certain Mather writes that the Christian religion is no other than the doctrine of living unto God by Christ and is a practical thing rather than a mere theory. The intention whereof is to animate a real solid vital piety and call, call forth such as lie dead in their sins unto a godly and sober righteous life, end of quote. Mather construed his understanding of the Christian religion as a doctrine of piety in opposition not only to the false religions of pagan idolatry, to Islam and Judaism, but also to what he considered false versions of Christianity. And here he was, of course, on the one hand, thinking of the papal church, um, also some high church or Catholic Anglicans, which were his special enemies, <laughs> but um, also uh, the deists and um, uh, the anti-Trinitarians in particular. As a doctrine of piety, the Christian religion fundamentally rests, according to Mather, on three maxims or practical articles in which all the true children of God are united. Um, and they who seriously and sincerely coalesce in this union are to be reckoned among the children of God. And we will see that um, um, this package is at once um, uh, Trinitarian. Um, it encapsulates sort of a high Trinitarianism uh, and combines it with a, a strong sort of experiential and practical dimension. But as Mather writes, the lesser matters, um, the adiaphora, should be conducted in a spirit of brotherhood grounded in these articles of practical godliness. For Mather, the three maxims in which he thought true Christianity um, was comprised were not abstract dogmatic formula to which rational assent suffices. They must become personal, practical, and experiential truths. And here you see the, the pietistic or early evangelical profile. This can only happen by the grace of God through the new birth in Jesus Christ. Um, No, oh, sorry, that was too early. Um, to these maxims, uh, uh, or on these maxims, Mather emphasized our great savior will have the hearts and lives of his people conformed that he may receive them to the glory of God, end of quote. So in explicating the three maxims, Mather immediately moves from the propositional level of systematic theology to the level of lived religion, as it were. Um, the first is the doctrine of the triune God to be adored as a creator and Lord of the world. While pagans worship many gods and Socinians and deists falsely construed the Godhead as a unity, true Protestants, Mather believed, were Trinitarians in the fullest sense. Believe in the triune God, Mather emphasized, was not a postulate of reason, however, but a personal and heartfelt faith. Most essentially, Mather understood true religion as following the command of God to worship and obey him, not as answering the dictates of innate moral laws. Next, secondly, comes the doctrine of Christ, according to which, and I quote, the Christ who is the eternal son of God incarnate in our blessed Jesus is our only redeemer who dying for us has offered a most acceptable sacrifice to the divine justice. So he makes a fairly traditional um, a Protestant understanding of the person and the salvific work of, of Christ, um, his second maxim. In Christ, we must be relying by faith and place our trust in his grace alone so as to become reconciled unto God, he writes. And herein lies the crucial difference to all forms of idolatrous religion. Men cannot obtain salvation and eternal life by sacrifices or moral action, but only, quote, under the conduct of him who being received up into the heavens now reigns on the throne of God and who shall return unto us as the judge of the world. Finally, if having faith means being filled with the love of God in Christ, this must ultimately bear in our fruit in our conduct. 
quote again, we must heartily love our neighbors and forever go by that golden rule, whatsoever you would have men do unto you, do you even the same unto them. So Mather equated this pure Christianity as um, encapsulated in these three maxims with what he viewed as the genuine Protestant religion defined not in confessional terms, but in strictly biblicist terms and um, applied to um, a person's personal life. So um, here's the experiential um, practical dimension. Now Mather's talk of the Christian religion and pure Christianity and evinces the influence, I think, of the new general theories of religion um, which uh, in the late 17th, early 18th century started to define Christianity as one among a plurality of religions. Operating in different colonial contexts, Puritan and Pietist missions massively contributed to the expansion of knowledge and the construction of um, non-Christian religions. Famous examples here would be Ziegenbalk's Das Malabarische Heidentum, or uh, his uh, genealogy der Malabarischen Götter. Um, and there are examples for a similar kind of um, studies on the New England side. All of this engendered a new kind of comparative self-reflexivity and makes Mather's project to determine the essential nature of Christianity different, I think, from earlier theological endeavors to overcome inner Christian divisions by drawing up the fundamental articles of faith. I mean, of course, this project has lots of um, precursors. You know, think of people like Comenius, think of people like John Dewey, but he couches it in these new terms of, you know, defining the Christian slash Protestant religion vis-a-vis -vis, um, other neighboring religions understood as false. Thus, Mather and his uh, pietist correspondents took it upon themselves to define the Christian religion in terms of an essential core and conflated these essential features with Protestantism. Protestantism was understood both as the original religion of mankind historically and as the authentically biblical religion true to God's self-revelation in scripture. What I mean by saying that he understood uh, Protestantism as the original religion of mankind is that he goes to great length in, in some of his writings to show that even the religion of paradise and the religion of Noah were essentially um, uh, Protestantism. Um, and I think here he's also significantly transcending um, the existing um, discourse um, in, 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 in Britain on, on the meaning of Protestantism. While in um, English usage, Protestantism had previously served mostly as an ecclesial umbrella term for different evangelical churches, it now became defined as the one true religion among other corrupted religions. This reflects how the evolution of Protestantism intersected with larger philosophical and theological debates about religion and different religions of humanity that, um, as I'm arguing, involved Enlightenment thinkers. Undoubtedly, they played an important part, but also these kind of revivalistic awakened um, uh, Christians. And, um, Manikim and Mather would explicitly speak of the Protestant religion, that is to say, the Christian religion rescued from the abominable corruptions of popery, the religion um, of primitive Christianity recovering by essays of scriptural reformation from the corruptions which the anti-Christian apostasy has brought upon it, end of quote. And in Malachi, Mather also unfolds his theory about how primitive Christianity as embodied by his maxims of piety was the full realization of humanity's aboriginal religion that could be traced back all the way to the proto-gospel received by Adam after the fall. Although much diluted and corrupted, 
this app original religion had been spread across the globe with the descendants of Noah's sons and was in this sense universal. Thus a true Protestantism as conceived by Mather and his correspondence was the purest expression and gave new force to this universal religion which had existed since the foundation of the world and persisted through all historical religions, however corrupted or diluted. At the same time, the confessional divisions and quarrels between the churches of the Reformation are interpreted as something, I quote, which the anti-Christian spirit of sectarianism hath contrived instead of substantial Christianity. In um, his letter to Trankabar, Mather claims that New England missions from the beginning had been based only on the fundamental articles of primitive Christianity, um, thus been conducted according to the principles of pure Protestantism to which the natives were given access through the catechisms and the Bible translations of John Eliot and um, um, other um, Puritan missionaries. And um, to demonstrate this, Mather even includes uh, samples of, his, of the Algonquin translations um, of the three maxims in his um, India Christiana. Remarkably, the Lutheran minister Johann Ernst Gründler uh, showed unbridled enthusiasm for these suggestions about concentrating on the essentials of the gospel and making them um, the core of uh, missionary activities. He wrote, that method of proceeding which you have been pleased to supply us with all, we have entertained with the highest satisfaction. It was, as he writes, the very same method that uh, we ourselves make use of here in treating with men about the salvation of their souls. Grunter claims that the Trankaba missionaries were like their New England colleagues, quote, laying aside those things which are matters of mere opinion and wholly applying ourselves to this, that Christ alone without any manner of disguise may be propounded and exhibited. And then, then he goes on to list four essential principles by which the Halapaitis teach the Christian faith. Um, and he agrees with Mather that Christianity cannot be inculcated as head knowledge and that these principles must uh, animate a vital practical uh, piety. So there's a considerable convergence um, in their understanding of um, this kind of broad pan-Protestantism defined by these kind of practical um, principles. Uh, it has to be said that uh, there's uh, a slight, uh, Gunther is not entirely um, honest with his correspondent here. In practice, we know, of course, that they uh, used a lot more confessionally colored uh, material um, in, in the mission field. But in these conversations, they were both emphasizing that they were moving beyond um, confessionally defined Protestantism. Um, so uh, I don't need to go into uh, the details of Gründler's definition of um, the four um, uh, planks or basic principles of Christianity, they basically overlap with um, what I've presented with Mather. Um, there's very little difference, um, surprisingly, really, to me. Um, I just want to point out um, that in reporting to Mather about the day-to-day -day work in Trankabar, uh, Gründler also emphasizing that um, um, they um, are working on purely scriptural foundations, that they are placing a heavy emphasis on uh, a, a translation of the Bible, and is also sending to Mather um, a sample, samples of this work. Yeah. Um, so he foregrounds the dedication of the Halle missionaries to make the word of God directly accessible to the Tamil people by translation. So for both sides, then biblicism was the foundation and conversion to a vital faith in Christ was the ultimate aim of everything they did.
Mather and his colleagues in Old and New England um, identified essential Christianity with the Protestant religion. I hope this has become clear. The German pietists clearly sh shared this basic conviction, but their terminology still varied, at least when writing in German or Latin. When writing in English, the pietists began to adjust, however, to the usage of their Anglophone friends. And this is a very significant um, development. And over time, the English usage of Protestant would be taken over into German. And um, some of the immediate, su immediate successors uh, to, to Franke, Siegenberg, and Gründler were among the first people to do so. So Mather's immediate correspondence in Halle and Trankeba did not yet make this transition. In their letters to Mather, Gründler, Schulz, um, and also the other missionaries, but also Franke, when he writes to uh, Mather, consistently employ the traditional adjectives evangelicus or evangelica when referring to a, a Protestant person or um, uh, the faith. Even though they are implying um, this uh, new and expansive um, sense of what that means. Similar in German texts, um, the uh, immediate contemporaries of Mather in, um, generally use evangelisch and its derivatives. However, in, his, in the English publications that uh, Anton Wilhelm Böhme um, was uh, putting out, he was already adopting the generalizing terms Protestant and Protestants to invoke the common identity of true Christians across denominational lines and he would then also do so when translating his own writings into German. So he would often um, write um, these in English first and then translate them into a German, carrying over this new and uh, uh, encompassing sense of um, uh, Protestantism. For instance, in the preface to his third installment of the propagation of the gospel in the East, published in 1714, which is essentially a promotional account of the Trankaba mission in England, Böhme talks about how the joint activities of pietists and evangelical dissenters anticipate, quote, the so long wished for union among Protestants during uh, the millennial age. Um, and when this is then translated into German, the terminology is carried over. Significantly, the terms Protestantisch and Protestanten were then also occasionally used in publications surrounding the Trankebar missions coming out of Halle. In October 1720, for instance, the Halle reports included an account written by Ziegenbalg for the SBCK, in which he approvingly cited the conclusions of Mather's Bonifacius, that's one of Mather's publications, that summary, summarily addressed the churches of the Reformation as Protestants and encouraged to do more for the propagation of the gospel and close the gap on papists. So for instance, they would write here, O ihr Protestanten, sollen es euch denn die Papisten zuvor tun? Um, uh, which essentially translated into, O oh, you Protestants, shall the papists outdo uh, you? Um, yeah, you know, this might not seem that significant uh, uh, a development for English speakers, but as I said, um, be, it is generally assumed that uh, Protestant Protestantismus was not adopted as a category of self-identity um, in the German language um, before uh, the 1740s, 1750s, and that was then rationalist theologians mostly doing this. Um, um, because people were still clinging uh, to the old terminology, either referring to themselves as evangelisch or the specific uh, uh, confessional categories like uh, Lutheran or um, Calvinist. But here we have a clear instance of um, the pietists using um, um, this word, adopting it from English and giving it this uh, new and uh, uh, comprehensive uh, sense. No less interested in and connected to the world of English evangelicals, the next generation of Halle pietists are readily accepted this new language and terminology 
and continue to partake in the same transoceanic discourse about Protestantism as the one true religion. A um, particularly striking example uh, comes from the Halle affiliated Lutheran superintendent for the Duchy of Magdeburg, Johann Adam Steinmetz. In 1738, he undertook a German edition of Jonathan Edwards' faithful narrative under the title Glaubwürdige Nachricht von dem Herrlichen Werk Gottes. And in a lengthy introduction, Steinmetz contextualizes Edwards' revival report for his German audience, um, also drawing on Cotton Mather's uh, Church History of New England, the Magnalia Christi Americana, and then calls upon his readers to receive the gospel news from abroad in the right spirit. And revival work in faraway New England, as Steinmetz assures his readers, grew um, um, grew from, and I translate it into English, those truths that are common to the entire Protestant church, so that it doesn't affirm special teachings of particular parties, but the teachings which we also confess. And note that he is using. Uh, in the German original, the gesamten protestantischen Kirchen in this new and uh, uh, broad sense. This kind of evangelical pan-Protestantism was also promoted in the German-speaking world through the popular pietist periodicals edited by Steinmetz, the Sammlung Auserlesener Materien zum Bau des Reich Gottes, collection of select materials for the building of God's kingdom, which were very popular and read by uh, uh, a lot of people in the, in the world of uh, German pietism. In these periodicals, German readers were treated to news from around the world, including the British colonies, which concerned Protestant church reform movements, missions and revivals, such as those in Trankabor or New England, indicating advances in the kingdom of God. And there are repeated instances in these publications of um, um, authors using uh, Protest uh, Protestantismus, Protestantish in, in this new um, um, transconfessional sense, Protestantismus as religion. On the German speaking side, the Pietists are, are thus among the pioneers of pan Protestantism. Um, uh, preceding the rationalists, the neo neologists by uh, a whole generation, I think. The reflections on Protestantism by Böhm or Steinmetz um, precede those by thinkers such as Baumgarten or Spalding, um, which have usually been um, um, seen as um, the first uh, to do so. On the Anglophone side, the early 18th century heirs of Puritanism, such as Mather or Edwards, uh, importantly contributed to the denationalizing and deconfessionalizing of the existing um, uh, use of the English terms Protestant or Protestantism. This went hand in hand with their construction of the category of religion as such. In conversation with their pietist liaisons across the Atlantic and the Pacific, they developed a version of the Christian religion that was quite distinct from the reason and morality centered conceptualization of latitudinarian Anglicans, let alone deists. Like the later luminaries of German Enlightenment theology, the latitudinarians and the deists, they would define Protestantism primarily in terms of freedom of conscience, interiority, reasonableness, and sound morality. By contrast, men like Mather or Böhme um, uh, would emphasize um, practical and vital piety grounded in a few quintessential um, scriptural doctrines. And they would emphasize the importance of um, mission uh, as a defining feature of the Christian slash Protestant religion. Now, neither Mather nor his pietist friends thought that true Protestantism had been fully realized yet, except in some individuals and church communities. Religious life in the big national churches of Europe appeared to them as mostly lifeless and corrupt. 
In their view, the true reformation was very much an unfinished project. This is one important reason why they were skeptical of contemporary schemes of church unification on the political level, such as the ones initiated by the court chaplain of Berlin, Daniel Ernst Jablonski, um, or um, uh, some of the um, Anglican bishops. Many English dissenters and German pietists did dream of an eventual unification of Protestantism or even uh, world Christianity, as in the case of the pietist diplomat and secretary of Prince George, Heinrich Wilhelm Ludolf. But most of these men, including Mather, Franke, and Böhme, really envisaged a union of hearts based on regeneration and spiritual renewal not of diplomatic agreements between ecclesiastical authorities. They were not interested in denominational mergers and even fearful that political unifications might strengthen the power of ecclesial hierarchies within the national churches and endanger the liberties of Protestant, uh, of dissenters and reformers. Only the spread of vital piety wrought by the regeneration through the, uh, regeneration through the Holy Spirit, Mather argued in his handbook for the theology students, the Manuductio Ad Ministerium, only that will uh, uh, found a sure foundation for a union among all parties of true Christians, however they may be dominated or dis uh, denominated or distinguished, end of quote. Like Böhme, however, Mather believed that this union would be fully realized only after the final destruction of Antichrist and the onset of the millennial age. On this side of the millennium, all Protestant churches abiding by the three essential maxims of Christianity uh, should be guaranteed full civil, li civil liberties and the freedom to associate and worship and the right to sacred corporations and self-government, as Mather points out. He even proposes a kind of general Protestant establishment in which all churches should equally partake. Um, I quote, um, oh, no, it's not on here, sorry. Um, and which uh, all Protestant churches should partake in equal privileges and advantages of the evangelical church state. Among e among each other, Protestants should practice pulpit and table fellowship um, and work together as much as possible. Ultimately, however, the final age of harmony and glory would not come by human agency. This is what they all emphasize as well. When Mather writes um, that um, that uh, God is upon his way to break down all false draughts and schemes with the anti-Christian spirit of sectarianism hath contrived instead of substantial Christianity. He means this quite literally, this uh, business about God being on his way. The second coming for him was not far off. In conjunction with it, he, like many pietists, expected an eschatological revival, which would enable the completion of the Ref Reformation within the existing Protestant churches and carry a purified Christianity to the far ends of the world. In his letter to Ziegenbalk, Mather even writes, and I quote, that the reformation and propagation of religion will be accompanied by granting over again those extraordinary gifts of the prophetic spirit by which the Holy Spirit watered the primitive church and at first spread and confirmed the Christian religion in the world. Mather thus expected a kind of latter day reign of the spirit prophesied in Joel and with it the renewal of the charismatic gifts that had been granted in support of the early church. And this is how he thought that um, the missions and the revivals would be successful in face of all that opposition. Through a massive outpouring of the spirit and with these gifts, true Protestantism would spread like wildfire and easily outdo and undo the successes of the Catholic missionaries. But now at last, he writes, what if after the 1260 years of Antichrist are expired, there should be heard the sound of abundance of rain. That's again, um, the idea of a latter day uh, spiritual rain. 
Now, Mather's millennialism and supernaturalism were certainly extreme, um, in, but in different variations and gradations, um, they played a major role for how most Puritans, evangelical dissenters, and pietists thought about the nature and destiny of Protestantism. In his propagation of the gospel in the East, Böhme similarly imagines the union and victory of the true Protestant church to come as the result of a global eschatological revival, which would bring about the conversion of pagan peoples as well as of Muslims and Jews. Apparently, the Trankabar missionaries also thought of their work in such an eschatological perspective. Responding to Mather's hints to the prophecy in Joel, Gründler writes, I quote, the word of God abundantly declares that in the latter days there must arise witnesses of the truth endued with the gifts of miracles that to facilitate his work in the conversion of the pagans, our God uh, may crown it with these extraordinary help to it and may furnish his missionaries with so great powers and bestow the gifts of miracles upon them, end of quote. Thus a millennial's eschatology um, was an integral element of this strand of the early 18th century discourse of Protestantism. To conclude, the Boston Trankabar Halle Network offers us an interesting perspective on the emerging discourse of Protestantism. It shows that this discourse from the beginning was multi-stranded, it was transoceanic as well, and by no means the exclusive domain of theologians associated with rationalism or latitudinarianism. But I don't wish to deny their role. I'm just saying there are more versions of this. The people in the Boston Trankabar Halle Network defined the essence of Protestantism and thus of the Christian religion in terms of a vital, that is experiential, conversion-oriented and activist piety grounded in biblicism. For them, the activist nature of Christianity included works of charity and, most importantly, missions. Christianity to them was a missionary faith with a strong eschatological orientation. A sense of being locked in a global end-time battle with the papal church on the one hand and the confrontation with non-Christian world religions in the mission fields on the other were key configurations of this discourse. And I believe that this distinct version and vision of the Protestant religion that developed among the correspondents of this network would remain influential throughout the second half of the 18th and into the 19th century, even as it continued to further develop with early evangelicals on the English side and churchly pietists on the German side. The evangelical alliance of the early 19th century, for instance, was an important heir to just this vision of Protestantism, I think. However, I do not wish to suggest that there were no other versions and visions of Protestantism among diverse evangelical and pietist circles. Were we to examine the early 18th century networks between different groups of radical German pietists, for instance, and English Philadelphians, we would certainly find a somewhat if not, but not entirely different understanding of what uh, true Christianity slash Protestantism essentially was. Or by the mid 18th century, the global networks of the Moravians uh, would add a unique strand to the discourse of Protestantism informed by the uh, Tropenlehre of uh, Zinzendorf. All of these would have to be taken into account if we want to arrive at a fuller understanding of how Protestantism began to be imagined as a world religion in uh, the early 18th century by evangelicals and pietists together. Thank you. <laughs>